Mike, is this, you, you got that one? All right. Well, happy Re Resurrection Day. I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. It's always kind of one of those fun things to be able to do. And uh, every year I'm reminded when I get up here to finally get to this point of how hard it is to preach to you on a full stomach. And also, and maybe the more difficult, how hard it is to listen on a full stomach. So I'll try to do my best here, and I, I ask you to do the same. But, you know, we, we refer to this day, what most refer to as Easter, and we realize the specialness of this day. And in the years past, we you know, have given some kind of a defense of the, of, uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like, that actually did happen. And that's something that uh, has been going on for a very long time. In fact, the passage that we'll be looking at here in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to turn there, actually Paul spends the entirety of the chapter giving a bit of a defense and really a hope for the, re uh, for the resurrection. And for good reason. Because honestly, the, in, in normal circumstances, and even beyond normal circumstances, the dead do not rise. There's a reason why the disciples were not standing beside the tomb waiting for Jesus to come out. They weren't looking for it. They didn't anticipate it. They didn't expect it. The dead do not rise. It was truly something out of the ordinary, extraordinary, when this actually did happen. But we've made a defense of that in the past, and if you want to hear something like that, you can go online and you can find the past sermons on that very topic. But I didn't want to do that this morning. I wanted to look at it from a different perspective. I wanted to do, like, what difference does it make for us in the day-to-day, -day, in and out of life? In other words, what hope do we gain by knowing and understanding and appreciating the resurrection? How does it get us out of bed in the morning? And there's an aspect of which, when we think about this, of course, we're looking at, well, it's a future hope. Well, that's true. It's a future reality. It's something we're looking forward to in the future when there's that resurrection that we get to participate. But what about now? I mean, is the resurrection simply only something that we look forward to, like, is out there someday, I'll have that, but in the meantime, here I am, I'm stuck? Or is there something more significant to that? Does it change the way that I view, the, view life or do life? So today I want to look at 1 Corinthians 15 to see some of the reasons of why that is. And there are really a lot of reasons that you could turn to, even, even in 1 Corinthians 15. But the little section that we're looking at, I think maybe is the most concentrated of those. And so I'd like to read to you from verses 16 through 22 this morning, as we consider and understand that the hope that you want for life comes from the hope that is found in the resurrection. Starting verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. First and foremost, we want to look at the hope of profitability. The hope of profitability. We want to know that the things that we do f will benefit us or profit us in some capacity. That's why we do stuff. That's why we do really anything in life. The reason you get up and, and go to the gym in the morning or in the afternoon, why? Why do you do that? Why do you torture yourself? Because you're looking for a benefit. You want to have, you know, you want to get your, your cardio up. You want to be able to have some more endurance. You want to get stronger. Your, your doctor's yelling at you for your high cholesterol. Any number of things is going on in there, but there's the benefit that you're going to the gym for a reason because you want to see some kind of a return in there. That's human reason. That's why we do things. Very, very rarely do we do something where we realize, this is going to hurt me. Even when it comes to sin, you think, well, the sin, and, and, and that, that's a detriment. Why do we do that? Well, that's true, but... We often look at that as the little profit at the beginning because sin is pleasurable for a season. So we pursue those things, even somebody's knowing this is going to hurt me far more than it's going to be good for me or that I'll enjoy this, but it's worth the trade-off. But it's kind of one of the rare exceptions. Otherwise, the things that we do in life, we're doing it, we're looking for a profit, we're looking for a benefit, even if that benefit is minor. And sometimes the things that we do are very minor, but they're important. And what Paul is saying here in this passage, specifically verse 16 and 17, is that if you divorce, if you separate the Christian message as a whole and the resurrection, you really have nothing. You've removed all the profit that has afforded you in Christianity. And you think about how broad of a statement that really is. 
I mean, that's, that's huge. You think the resurrection is that important that you can take and accept even all the rest of the Bible, all the good things that are contained in the Bible, and you remove simply the resurrection. You deny simply the resurrection, and it's a waste of time. It's not worth it. But that's ultimately what he's saying here. In fact, if you drop down to verse 32, we won't make any long comments on it, but you realize there what he's saying is, as Paul's continuing to talk about this, but he says, uh, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. It's not worth it. I don't know what those beasts specifically at uh, Ephesus were, probably some kind of opposition, some, some individuals that were, that were trying to fight against him. But he's really saying at the end of the day, Christianity and the risks that it will bring to your life and the interruptions that it will bring to your life, if there is no resurrection, it's not worth it. There's no profit. There's no profit here at all. It's a sin qua non, without which nothing. If there is no resurrection, it's a waste of time. And your time in life would be far better spent just simply eating and drinking and realizing, because tomorrow I'm going to die. Get all that you possibly can. Which is hard for us, because many people will make the arguments like, I deny a lot of the supernatural of the Bible, the miracles, the resurrections, all those kinds of things, but the Bible still has so much to commend it. I mean, think that this is where we gain our morality from. This is how we define goodness. I mean, even, even secular people will acknowledge the benefits of the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, these are all good things. If we can find them in the Bible, are you really seriously telling me that if we remove the resurrection, we have nothing? And that is Paul's argument. It's that big of a deal. In fact, Paul, in 17, look at what Paul says. Then those, uh, he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. In other words, there's no profit there. There's no benefit for you there. That's exactly what he's saying. You might as well follow your heart and the passions and the directions that your heart has for you. Because you drop down to verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. It's a waste of time. Might as well be a hedonist instead. Now, not everybody thinks like that. Not everybody thinks like that. I was reading an article in, uh, in Time Magazine just from a few years ago, and the author was, was there, and, and he had been dealing with some, I think, actually some stress and some anxiety in his life, and he finally went to the doctor and, and, and went there and was kind of surprised because he thought the first thing the guy's going to do is just pull out the prescription pad, start writing, you know, you know, take this, do this, do this. And instead he asked him, like, have you tried, like, religion? Have you tried, like, like meditation and meditative practices? And he's like, well, no. So start there. And lo and behold, the guy actually found that this was actually working for him, that he enjoyed this, just kind of meditation. And in the article, he's quoting from the Bible. He's quoting from, I think it was uh, uh, Buddhism and, and some of these things. Like, and, and really what he said at the end of the day, yes, religious people are much typically more happy than those that are secularists. But he said, honestly, it really doesn't matter what the content of your faith is, or the denomination, or the, not the denomination, but the, the brand of religion even that your faith is, because community, the community that revolves around that faith is more important than the content of that faith. And you'll be happier. And you'll be better off in life, more well-rounded. You know, that's the kind of logic that Paul would say, yeah, no. That's not going to be a thing, because for something to truly be profitable, it has to trade in the truth. And for all those religions, when they come together, you realize how wildly different they all are. You cannot have a resurrection. You cannot have reincarnation. You cannot have, you know, going into, like, nothingness, just ceasing to exist, and have all of those things being true at the same time. And there were probably dozens more little categories that these various religions and systems of belief go into. But if you lose the truth, you can't profit from it. See, what we believe has to be true. And when Paul's talking about the resurrection, he says, if you get rid of it, realize you're trading away the truth and along with it all of the profit that comes along with it. It's not any different than if you have a, a, a sum of money that you want to invest in and you start looking around for investment opportunities. One of the most essential pieces of information that you need to make a good investment is the truth. 
like what's the possibility of failure? What's the possibility of success? What's the return on investment that we can expect here? If you remember when you were going back through Ecclesiastes, I told you about Jeff Bezos and his parents who, uh, he asked them to invest in his company, his startup company, Amazon, way back in 1995. And they invested a little over $250,000, but he told them, he said, look, you have a 70% chance of never seeing this money again. They invested anyway, to their credit. But you could imagine like, being told that you have a 70% chance of losing your money. But you know why they went forward? Because they could trust their son. He was up front with them. They could work with the truth. You can do something when you have the truth. You know what to do. You can base your decisions. And it kind of worked out pretty good for them. If you remember, their return on investment was 12 million percent. I had to double, I looked that up and I thought, that can't be right. It, I thought I to put too many zeros in it. No, it really was 12 million percent return. That's what the article had. But the reason they could do that, and the reason that they did do that, is because they could trade in the truth. They could make a proper investment. They could make judgment calls. And when it comes to the religion, when it comes to here, Christianity really, and he's, Paul is telling us about the resurrection, he says, this is in fact the truth. And if you remove the truth, you remove this element from it, you have absolutely nothing left. There's no profit in Christianity at all. You say, okay, great, but you're talking about the resurrection, you're kind of like proving it a little bit, but where's the hope for the in and out now? It's a good question. The prophet, according to verse 20 and 22, is this. That Jesus, in verse 20, was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Those first fruits always means if, if this is the first, there's more to follow. The resurrection doesn't just affect Jesus Christ, but it also affects those that are in him. That is a hope that we all have that is, that is coming here. In verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That if you have a relationship with Christ, you have a hope that you will rise again. And that's a hope that actually helps you now. It is something, of course, that's a future reality for all of us, but it's a hope that helps us now. It gets us out of bed now because we realize that if we will be raised with Christ, there's, there's a profit and a benefit for us that death doesn't get the final word. That there's a robustness by which we can face life and realize, you know what? This is not going to be the end of me. However this, this problem persists and however this, this, this difficulty uh, maintains itself, I know what the end is going to look like and I can keep moving forward because I understand and realize my greatest need in life has been satisfied and I know what's going to come. I know what's going to come. It allows you to move forward. It also helps you realize that when you fail in life, you're not removing yourself from that hope. And we've all faced failure. We've all had things that maybe didn't turn out the way that we wanted to, and we realize it's not all lost. I'm still safe in the arms and the hands of God, and my eternal destiny is not in danger. Because all those who are in Christ, we have that full and final hope of where we will be. It's guaranteed the sting of death is finally and fully removed for us. And see, that's a confidence. You can wake up in the morning, regardless of what else is going on in your day, and realize, you know what? I have a hope of an eternal destiny with God. And there should be a robustness to your life and a robustness to your faith because of it. And you can look at death and regardless of things that maybe threaten you and threaten your life and realize that will not be the end of me. Now, sometimes people are like, what happens if I'm afraid to die? Well, keep in mind, I mean, the, the, the death is part of the curse. It's not really something you're supposed to look forward to. It would kind of defeat the purpose of a curse. But it also means that we, we come at this that, that uh, yes, it may not be great, it may not be what you want, but it, it is not the end. You don't have to look and be like, I can't wait. Right? I think that's what we kind of sometimes sell ourselves on. Or think, and people are like, I, I feel like if I'm not sitting out there going, I can't wait until I die, then there's something wrong with me. No, there's something wrong with you if that's the way you think. You're not supposed to look forward to that, but you don't have to fear it. See, there's a difference there. And that's okay. So following the Christian path... Here, Paul is saying, while denying the resurrection of Jesus, which was almost certainly what was going on, at least with some of the Corinthians, he's saying, you're, you're wasting your time. You, you've, you've taken out the very thing that makes Christianity profitable 
and beneficial to you. And any hardship or difficulty that you face, like the beasts of Ephesus from verse 32 we already looked at, it's simply not worth it. You might as well take the easy path and get what you can now because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We've taken all the profit out. I say, don't do that. So profit is one key thing to finding hope in the resurrection, but it's not the only thing. Another one is just the reality of being forgiven. If you've ever carried a burden in life, you know how powerful guilt really can be and how much forgiveness and the need for forgiveness can really do for someone. So here we find here in 17c, the latter part of that, you're still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, you're still in your sins. But if you are in Christ, you realize that you're forgiven. Paul almost always mentions the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ together in tandem. Almost always locks them together. We don't normally do, at least I don't find myself doing that all the time. We talk about, you know, the, the death of Christ on the cross, the blood of Christ, you know, has saved us from our sins. Or we quote from uh, like Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And I, and I think we're doing something inadvertently that we ought not to. We're separating the death and the resurrection of Christ, unintentionally. But I think we separate that. I mean, even the symbolism that we have all over the place that we think of when Christianity, it's, it's the way that Christ died, it's his execution. But what about the resurrection? Paul always puts those together, or almost always puts those together. And I'm not saying we need like a, a picture of an empty tomb up here somewhere. We have to remember the cross is empty for a reason. It's there in front of us. We just have to make sure that we emphasize that from time to time and remember that, that Christ rose again from the dead. But if we only talk about the death of Christ or the shedding of his blood, we're only looking at half the picture. We need the whole thing. It's not any different than if you were to try to pay for something like a one-sided bill. You, know, you pull out a 20 and they, they printed the front and it's got all the markings on it that it should have. So we're not talking counterfeit. Right? But you look at that, you see you know, the, the colors are right, the labels are right, the watermarks are right, you know, they hold it up to the light and it's got that little strip in there that you can see and it tells you what the nomination, like everything's perfect. You take out that little funny pen they always write them on, everything works. But if you turn, turn it over, like they just forgot to print the other side. And you slide it across the table to someone, you try to buy some goods and services or whatever it happens to be, what are they going to assume? There's something wrong with it. It's incomplete. It's insufficient. Now, is it fake? No. But they're not going to know what to do with it because there's something missing. You've forgotten the other side. And so without the other side, it's not going to do much. We can't just emphasize the death of Christ. We need, of course, the resurrection as well. Because with the resurrection combined in there, it takes away the shame and replaces it with forgiveness and a fulfillness of, of the, the debt that has been paid. When you write a check somewhere, you, you pay someone, pay a bill, you send that check, and how do you know when that bill has been fully paid and satisfied? You know, I think nowadays you just go on the computer and, you know, look it up. But, that, you know, not that long ago, you would get the check back in the mail. Well, it was canceled, right? You had your canceled check. It was proof, almost like a receipt. It was proof that it had been done. How do we know that the wrath of God, the debt that we owe here, has been satisfied or been paid? Because Christ rose again. If he had not risen again, there would be no sense. Because I paid your debt. Well, great, you're gone. But how do I know that debt's been fully satisfied? You don't. How would you know that, you, it, that more is not required? You wouldn't. But the fact that Jesus comes back and begins walking around, it's like having that receipt paid in full. It's like having that canceled check in your hand paid in full. It's been satisfied. The debt that you owed has been satisfied because of Christ. And seeing Christ walking around and doing those things reminds us, tells us, communicates to us that that debt is done. It's over. And so the fear that maybe Christ's sacrifice was insufficient is done away with. Which, again, it makes it, you, when you realize that, when you understand the resurrection, what it does, then, then why do people try so hard to do more works and do more things to put on their account? They try to earn, for their, earn something for their salvation. It doesn't make any sense. The resurrection of Christ tells us the debt has been paid. It's been satisfied that you are, in fact, forgiven. And that brings a sense of freedom, or it should for you. That your guilt, that your shame, 
that your sins, the things that even that you're still doing today or now or will do, they're, they're truly gone. Maybe you don't appreciate what it means to carry guilt throughout life, but some of you do. Some of you have maybe a secret. Some of you have things going on in your lives. Like, I hope nobody knows this about me. Because there's a sense of shame and there's a sense of guilt that comes along with that. But you do realize that in Christ, there's, there's a freedom that comes there too. You've been freed from that. That's exactly what Jesus did. He came, he paid for those sins, taking your guilt and your shame with him. That burden is removed. Jesus removes that burden. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, they're the, the, the wrestling with forgiveness even though they'll talk about, I just can't forgive myself. You know, I did something, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, I'm, I feel guilty over something that I've committed, something that I've done. I cannot forgive myself. And you, you have to understand like, that that's not a thing. You might feel guilty. I'm not discounting that, but that's not a thing. You didn't sin against yourself. You didn't wrong against yourself. And to say, well, God can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself, you're committing actually a couple things there. One, you're saying that your standards are suddenly now higher than God's. Don't think you want to go there. But you're also saying that the, the, the sacrifice of Christ was insufficient for something. I don't think you want to go there either. When Christ died, he took that away from you. You simply need to accept what it is that Jesus has done for you. And that guilt and that shame, you're suddenly aware of what you were capable of. You might be embarrassed and you might be ashamed. But you realize, like, I, I can't believe I did that. That's probably a fair assessment. But that's, that's human depravity. That's what we are all capable of at any one moment. We can do those kinds of things. And you might be surprised that you can do that. But don't go down at that martyr's complex of like, I just can't forgive myself because this happened or I did this. In Christ, forgiven, paid in full, it's done. And you can rest in that. It doesn't mean there aren't still consequences. There, there can be probably going to be, but Christ has forgiven you. And it really doesn't matter what it is that you're afraid of or holding on to. I read a story this past week. I think the guy who wrote it was, um, I think it was Carlisle, I think it was his name. But he was detailing this story that was five years in the making, but he had uh, in, in a city somewhere, and he had a, a neighbor, a Nigerian neighbor, and they were friendly with them for the last five years, and, you know, back and forth, and, but just never real deep. And it shared Christ with him multiple times. It just it never really came with anything. And then there was this one day, kind of in the alleyway between their houses, they heard him, and he was just, he was just all upset. He was crying and just upset, and they, they started talking to him, like, what's going on? And here, they, he, they're having marital problems, and, and so they're like, oh, come over, we'll talk. And just, they started unpacking this marriage that was just forever broken and not going to get better anytime soon, and just so much sin and so much depravity and, 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 and brokenness that was in this marriage, and trying to work through this. And it just, it just really didn't get very far. And they're trying to witness to him, and he's just, he's not super interested. Well, that was a matter of, of weeks and, and maybe even a few months when that was going on. And finally, this family was on a camping trip. And they got a call. And come to find out that this man, Martin, it was his name, had gotten into a really heated argument with his wife, shot and killed her. Police had come, taken him away. There's police tape all around the, 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 the premises, and, and the reporters were there. It was kind of a big deal. So they ended their kind of camping trip early and came back and were kind of just there and not knowing what to do. And because he had turned himself in, actually, uh, I, I guess that's a thing. They, they let him out on bail for a brief period of time. And they saw him come home, and he had to call a locksmith to open the door to get into his own house. And the, uh, they, the, the, the neighbors here, the, art, the author of the article, was talking to him a little bit. And she's like, trying to, again, talk about Christ, talk about forgiveness, talk about... And he's just like tried to defend himself a little bit, kind of over the events of what had taken place, just not interested. As that week progressed, had a little bit more opportunities, and, and finally Martin came over to their house, knocked on the door, and said, hey, could you tell me about Jesus again? And he got saved. Comes to church for the very first time, Easter Sunday. Comes in, it was the, it was, he had always, his uniform, so to speak, had always been just a pair of baggy jeans, these rubber sandals and a t-shirt. That's what he'd always worn. But that Sunday, he had a pair of khakis on, a blue shirt, a tie, looked nice, came to church, enjoyed the service. It was his first time 
in church. It was the last time he was in church because later that week he was convicted, sentenced to life in prison, never darkened the door of a church again. Broke the heart of the man writing this article. But there was a sense of joy and relief on Martin because he knew that he was forgiven. It doesn't take away the consequences of his actions, the sadness or the sinfulness of his actions, but we realize that even a man like that can be and was, in fact, forgiven. It's grace. Because he didn't deserve it. Neither do you. It's grace. The author of that article found out later that he passed away in prison. He looks forward to the day when he sees him again in glory. Because there's a hope in resurrection and that Martin will be there because he's been forgiven. We have a satisfaction, not a, not a satisfaction. We do have a satisfaction, but we have a profitability in God and the resurrection, the forgiveness and the hope that that brings. And you put those two things together and it sounds a lot like you've been accepted by God and indeed you have in Christ. And that's where we go next. Hope of acceptance. Honestly, one of the greatest blessings in the Christian, that a Christian can know is that God accepts them, you, now. Let's look at verse 17 again. I know we've read it several times, but we're going to like, it's written in the negative. We want to turn it around and see what it says. So look at verse 17 and, and understand what I'm doing here. Since Christ has been raised, your faith is profitable and you are no longer in your sins. You have to understand like, th- that I'm taking a liberty, but that isn't in fact what it's saying. It's the, it's the reverse image of what's been written there. It's true now. You don't have to cling to a hope that they will be, your sins will someday be gone. That one day, God will accept you. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that God accepts you now because of the hope that we have in the resurrection. Your sins are gone now. God accepts you now. I don't think you understand how radical that idea really is when it comes to religious beliefs that people have and hold on to. Follow these rules, and then we'll talk. Do all these kinds of things, and then maybe, just maybe, you'll be acceptable to me. So I wanted to look at a similar relationship, one that we can relate to, to see how terrible this really is. I was talking to Bailey and Ann, and they were given their uh, engagement story. And what you probably don't know, it's a bit of a secret, is that when Bailey uh, asked Ann to marry him, he not only gave her an engagement ring, he gave her a cookbook. It's true. Gave her a cookbook. See, Bailey has a favorite dessert, cosmic brownies. And that recipe for that, uh, that dish, that dessert of his, is found on page 121. And he handed it to her and he said, look, hon, I'll give you this. And if you can make this for me and make me happy and follow the rules and the commands of how to do this, After maybe 50 years or so, maybe I'll consider accepting you or taking you as my wife. Because you see, you turn to page 121, and it simply says that there's the rules and the commandments of the cookbook. Thou shalt take three cups of all-purpose flour. Thou shalt take two tablespoons of unsalted, don't mess that up, unsalted butter, a certain brand of cocoa powder. You're going to do a bunch of other stuff, mix it together and bake it at 350 for I don't know, 30 minutes or so, and you will get brownies. If you do that, and you keep that religiously, and maybe even, you know, you can up the ante a little bit. You can improve on maybe this recipe, but if you do this for the next 50 years or so, I'll consider taking you and accepting you to be my wife. And you think, that's terrible. He really did that? Don't worry, Ann already slapped him for it. You don't have to do that. But... See, you look at that scenario and you think, that's terrible. That's terrible. Why why would anybody think that? Why would anybody do that? Well, it only makes sense to Bailey, so you can ask him. But 
But unfortunately, that's how so many people try to approach God. That's what they do. They take the Bible and they go to like the Ten Commandments or they go to the various other places of the Bible and think, look, this is how we have to make God happy and I'm going to spend my lifetime trying to make God happy. And if I can be successful, maybe, just maybe, when I stand before God at the pearly gates, he'll let me in if I kept them well enough. The reality is when you look at Anne and Bailey and you consider that relationship at what point does Anne actually know that Bailey loves her? She doesn't. Her entire life will be spent with a fear and an element of doubt and fear in the back of her mind going, I'm not really sure if Bailey actually loves me. Sure, I've made him happy for today, but what about tomorrow? Or maybe, maybe I think I'm okay, but there was a time in which I forgot or I ran out of ingredients and I substituted something and it wasn't good enough. And he remembers that and he's going to hold me accountable for it. Maybe it's not going to be enough. When will, it, when will she know? She won't. She'll never be confident that he actually loves her. And for so many people, they're never confident that God actually loves them, that God actually accepts him. But that's not what the Bible's saying here. Of course, there are rules and principles and things that are in Scripture that we're supposed to be keeping. But the resurrection of Christ says that those who are in Christ are accepted and it's valid now. That's what verse 22 is emphasizing. In Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ we are made alive. That's true now. That's something that we can bank on and that we can enjoy. That's guaranteed to be taking place. We're accepted now because we're in Christ because our, our sins are forgiven because of the resurrection of Christ. I think it's worth noting here, we talked about in Christ all live, but in Adam all die. And sometimes the, the, the question becomes, like, is that really fair? Like, I inherited this sinful nature from my parents, and, and so maybe it's their fault, in part because nobody in our day and age wants to take responsibility for anything. But the reality is, if you make that and level that against your parents, my parents sent this down to me or gave this down to me. I inherited it from them. That's true, but they can keep doing it. Eventually, we, we want to back at Adam anyway. Is that really fair? Well, we have to keep in mind that really everything in life that we do affects other people. It's just how it works. Most of the time we don't think about it, or most of the time we just don't, it, it's okay. We, we, ex, we accept it, we expect it. But, but there are so many things that we do that, that, that come to us that, that, that affect other people in various ways. It reminds me a little bit of the story with... Um, the, the two teens in, in uh, Washington, D.C., they, they carjacked that Uber driver. I think it was uh, Uber or, or a food delivery driver. He was like a 60-year-old man. Two teens, like 13 and 15. They, they tried to hot carjack him. Didn't work out so well. The, uh, he got pinched between the, the, the door and the car when they hit a lamppost and the car flipped over and he died on the scene and they got out. I think it's terrible. It's true. And it's not fair because they do all this and he's the one that suffers. He's the one that dies. It's not fair, but it's what happened. See, their actions affected other people. Your actions affect other people all the time. And we often just don't think anything of it, but that's the way life works. It's also not fair when you consider that you inherit an inheritance, an actual inheritance, you know, the, 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 maybe the sum or money from a loved one, a parent or, or a, a sibling or some other thing. You get that kind of an inheritance. It's not really fair. You, according to Ecclesiastes, you didn't earn that. You didn't work for that. I and mean, it makes us remember, of course, well, where else would it go? It makes more sense to come to you than to maybe just be spread out or do anything else with. And that's true, but you didn't work for it, and that's the principle. And you're, you're the one that finds yourself with it. Genetics also are inherited, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. But you didn't do anything to get those. Salvation, we are reminded again, isn't fair because it's someone else's righteousness that's put on your account. You didn't earn that. You don't deserve it. And yet it's given to you. When you think about it, you start realizing how silly it really is when we try to put works into this equation, the things that we do, the things that we strive for, when we realize it's what God has done for us. And the hope that we have in the resurrection means that all these things are settled for us. In Adam, 
all die. But in Christ, we are all made alive. It's not fair, but it's what is. And it is truly a good gift. You know, back in 2020 when we started, I told you as we got there the first uh, Sunday in January, I said, hey, this is 2020. It's the year of the ophthalmologist or optometrist. Most of you kind of sat like that, like, what? Like 2020, you know, like vision, you know, it took a while. And, you know, the reality was that we were hoping that 2020 would be the year we could really see clearly. We kind of did, and we didn't like what we saw. We saw very much how easily and quickly we could become divided, how corrupt things really are, how vulnerable and unpredictable things really can be. In many ways, it seems to continue. We need hope. We need hope in a hopeless world. We need hope when we get out of bed in the morning to seize another day. We need something that we can cling to. And honestly, the resurrection becomes that thing that we can latch on to and say, you know what, I don't know how everything's going to turn out in the grand scheme of things, like with, with this day, this job, this opportunity. I don't know that. But in Christ, we have a hope that we can count on, that we know eternity is settled. I don't have to fear death today, regardless of even if it comes to find me and I'm not expecting it. I don't fear that. I know that I have been forgiven and that I can go through life without the guilt and the shame that maybe my, my mind wants to put on me. I know that's been taken care of and it's gone and it's removed and I can seize and do this day. I know that as I go about today that I can go about this day knowing that I am accepted and by God now that my eternal security is secure in this and the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees all of those things for me. And that's something that it will never change. That is truly a, a profit and a blessing and a benefit to us now. And I hope that's something that will make you hopeful each and every day. Now, what won't give you hope is if you're not in Christ now. You can be, but you realize that's, that's, that's that transition. That's that decision that each and every one of us has to make, and nobody else can make that for you. But it's that time in which you consider the things of God, the, the truths that are found in his word, and either accept or reject the sacrifice of Christ that he made for you. That's your choice. All of us are sinners. The Bible talks about all this falling short of the glory of God. There's no one that's coming to the table and says, hey, you know what? I know everybody else has missed it and not made it, but I'm the, the exception. That's not a thing. It's really not a thing, and, and, and to, to, to take that is really to, to really misunderstand the Bible, and it's to misunderstand yourself. I'm not saying that you're as evil or wicked or as sinful as possible. No, most people aren't that. A lot of people are very nice people, very moral people, very what you might call good people. You'd love to have them as your neighbor, as your friends, people that you work with. We'd love to be able to do that. There are a lot of people in those categories, but it doesn't take away the fact that you are still in your sins. If you're outside of Christ, you're still in your sins. Those things have not been forgiven, and you're trying to do life apart from God. And it's not something that's going to be ever acceptable. See, Christ has made a way for you, and he simply says, Come and accept what I have done for you. Follow me. Call on the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. And if that's something you still have yet to do, man, I would encourage you, make today, make Easter Sunday the day where you say, I want to settle this. I want to make this right. I want to start today to have this relationship that I can enjoy the hope that I have in the resurrection and in Christ. That I can look forward to this and realize and have the profitability of the resurrection, the assurance of the resurrection, and the forgiveness that the resurrection has wrought for me. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this opportunity on this Resurrection Sunday and the implications that we find going on here in Paul based on that truth. Lord, we thank you. We realize how unworthy of this we really, really are. And yet, Lord, you freely gave of your Son to make a way for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us never to get over that, that we might be fully enamored by that, that they would season the conversations that we have around the table today, both at lunch and dinner, that we would never let that conversation, those thoughts, leave us, Lord, I pray that it would give us hope. A hope that we are just forever lacking in the last several years, it seems like. 
so many things have gone on, and yet, Lord, there's one unchanging truth and element in all of this. The resurrection of your Son happened. And because of that, we have hope. A hope that cannot be and will not be taken away from us. Lord, we're thankful for a great hope in dark times. In Christ's name, amen.